Welcome, everyone. I'm sorry for the delay, but uh, we were just waiting to get more people on. I'm Ford Spalding, chair of the uh, Community Center Building Committee. Um, this is our, we're coming near the end, everybody. Um, today is really going to be an update of where we are. Uh, then um, on June 2nd, we're going to do a pre-town meeting preview which will be actually the town meeting presentation. And it's the only one where we're gonna be able to look at a visual that's not on a piece of paper. So that's gonna be on June 2nd. And then the town meeting is Saturday, uh, June 12th at uh, 10 a.m. Um, we'll ask you over and over again, but uh, please everybody um, invite as many people as you can. Uh, I think the quorum is 175. Um, we really, I think, need more than that to justify a vote on this. So um, please, we'll get as many people as we can would be uh, very helpful. Uh, we're gonna start the presentation um, now um, and um, we're gonna keep you all on mute and then We'll release you all and you'll be off mute and, and please ask questions, make comments, um, et cetera. That would be uh, very helpful. So I'm gonna turn the meeting over to Phil Palumbo. Uh, Phil is our owner's project manager from Collier's uh, International. Phil? Thanks, Ford. So I'll, I'll start with the budget update. Um, so as folks are aware, or you're gonna be aware now, um, up to this point, we've been designing to a $13 million total project budget which was previously approved at the October 2019 town meeting. And within that $13 million, we've been using 9.6 million as our construction budget. So the, the budget that our design of our building and our site want to be, wants to be estimated to fall within. We had the feasibility study estimate process back in January. Uh, and it was at that point where we learned that the 18,000 square foot building program that we developed through the programming process early on was respectively between $2 million and $3.7 million over budget. So that's between the renovation scheme and the new construction scheme. So with that, we moved ahead into the current schematic design phase with a, a more tightened up uh, con condensed building program, but one that still fell in line with the goals and objectives that we learned during programming um, to get us back on budget. We had the schematic design estimate process a few weeks ago. And it was at that point where we learned of this recent spike in construction costs. And we learned that uh, between the renovation scheme and the new construction scheme, we actually went up. We are now uh, $3.8 million over budget to $4 million over budget. Uh, so this spike in construction costs is related to um, escalated costs in building materials, um, as well as contractors being less aggressive on their bidding, as well as being more selective on the projects they go after. So essentially decreasing the competitive bidding pool, if you will. So after coordinating with cost estimators and general contractors to really vet and confirm those numbers, um, the, the consensus and the message was very consistent, very clear that those escalated numbers unfortunately are real. Um, and it's an unknown when the market's gonna kind of stay below and get back to some type of normalcy. So with that, at last week's uh, Community Center Building Committee meeting, it was voted on by the committee to move ahead in the rest of this schematic design phase and, and into the June town meeting with the understanding that this is now a $18 million project with a $13.5 million construction budget. So if the project's approved at the June town meeting, and then once we complete design and go out to bidding, if the bids come in under that $13.5 million construction budget, then the Dover taxpayers borrow less. So with that, I'll hand it back over to Ford because I know he wants to speak to this topic a little further. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Phil. Um, I'd like to just add a few things to what uh, Phil said. And at the last Selectman's meeting uh, a week or so ago, um, Selectman John Jeffries said in reference to our project, and I'm going to quote him, you can only control what you can control. So you, only, you can only control what you can control. And that really sent a message to me and, and to some others. In March of 2020, the world found out that we were beginning a worldwide COVID pandemic. Here we are in May of 2021, and we're still dealing with that issue. It has affected our way of life. It has affected our friends and family. It's affected our economy. And it's infected the construction industry. We're learning 
that those effects may well have repercussions well into the year 2022 for that industry. You heard about the trends in construction costs, supply chain, labor issues. You've all read about that. You've heard about it. These are all issues which we in Dover have no control over. We have no control over where the construction uh, world is going. We have no control uh, over increased costs in the market, supermarkets. Connor, Connor, you got to get ready. Sorry, Ford, I had to mute you. Can you uh, unmute yourself, please? Sorry, everybody. Um, as, as I said, we have no control over what COVID did to us, no control over the construction costs, no control of inflation that's going on in the car industry and when you go to the supermarket. So we were as surprised as you are when the estimated costs came way over our budget. And we're now looking at a total budget of around $18 million of which 13 million is construction costs. Our team looked at reducing the scope of the project. And that just was really not realistic. It reduced space in our existing plan and our existing building. And that would not accommodate many of our programs. So that just didn't seem to make sense. And when we did that, we were with our cost estimators, we were only able to reduce about a million and a half dollars and we're still reducing the building. So my advice is we need to get control of where we are. You have seen and will see in a few minutes our two excellent plans to present to you. We have a renovation of our 1910 wing of the Carroll building plus new additions to that design. And we have a brand new building design. Both plans fit in our current total cost of $18 million. Both plans have the same activity rooms, offices, and they meet the program requirements. Both plans meet your request from the October 7, 2019 town meeting. It gives us a renovation plan and a new build, building option. And we, the voters, have now the option of selecting which one we want. So what is in our control? On June 12, the citizens, by their vote, have the opportunity to set a new limit of $18 million that our professionals feel should work for us. As Phil said, if the bid price, well, as Phil, as the bid prices come in higher, the building committee can reject them and rebid. If they still come in higher, the only way we could proceed further is to hold another town meeting and see if you really want to go even higher. That decision is on our, your control. On the other hand, if we're fortunate and bids come in lower, like one, two, three, or even higher, then we can accept the lowest bid and not spend the $18 million. The reduction in costs results in savings to you, the taxpayer. This is in our control. Another factor that affects cost is the cost of borrowing money. The interest rate today is extremely favorable, but waiting, may see higher rates in the next year or two. I suspect it will see higher rates. So now is the time to look at those rates and take advantage of them. That is also in our control. Our team has developed two excellent solutions for us to have a great community center. A center to meet our friends, make new friends, a center to participate in all types of activities, both active and passive a center that welcomes ages three to 93. So it is now in our control to solve the 20 year plus issue once and for all. Thank you. Next slide and I'm gonna turn right. over to Phil to go through our plans. I mean, to uh, John to go over our plans, sorry. Sure, thank so you for it. From uh, and Arkansas. Yeah, I'm Right, I'm John Richardson, a project manager, project architect for Fennec McCready. Um, I wanted to briefly, before we get into the plans, we have plans and visualizations, but before we get into those, I wanted to briefly, um, in a few slides, give you um, a little context for those of you who are 
not as familiar. It seems like most of you have, have been to these presentations before. But if you remember back in the fall, we, um, when we started programming, we developed with the building committee, and we talked about this at the first public forum, a criteria for success, which were a, a range of criteria in five different categories by which we've been evaluating our work all the way through, whether it's the program options, the different alternatives we looked at for construction, and now it's appropriate to revisit these and use these to, uh, to evaluate the final two options, the new construction and the renovation addition option. I won't go through them in detail, but there's, there's some general ones that are really kind of mandates, you know, that we meet the town's budget, Ford's talked about that, that we provide universal access and we maximize grant opportunities. Functionality, we wanna be, um, you know, make it as functional um, a building as possible in all the different ways that are, are mentioned below there. To support, as Ford says, you know, uses by everyone in Dover from ages three to 93. Um, we wanna make, you know, a great experience. So there's some experiential criteria in terms of the, the feeling both inside and out of the building and also that it's a healthy building. Um, especially important in these days, now that we're more aware of air quality with COVID. Um, in terms of community aspect, we want the building itself to be well sited and to complement the town center of Dover and, and, to, and as to be, as, more importantly, as a structure, a focal point for town life uh, through its program and through its design. And of course, sustainability has been a constant uh, discussion and uh, these are some of the, the main criteria, but we're focused on energy efficiency, um, minimizing light pollution, uh, as well as resiliency. So those were our criteria for success. Um, and as, as Phil mentioned, we went through the program a couple of times. We did reduce it a little bit uh, after feasibility estimates, but we held on to all the key components and, and, and feel collectively that this is the best balance of the different interests that provides a full range of activity spaces that serves the wide range of activities that we've discussed throughout this study and uses the principle of flexibility where they're not owned spaces, but they're shared spaces throughout the day as a way of maximizing that flexibility and getting the most um, value for the town of Dover. And we anticipate a building that is heavily utilized uh, throughout the course of the day. Um, um, and uh, we'll get into this when we can show the plans, but, um, and then this was kind of alluded to earlier, but as the, uh, as the estimates and the designs played out, because the renovation option does have a renovation component, which is not a completely new structure, there is a little bit of cost savings there. And so the renovation option is a little bit bigger because of that the less reduced cost of renovation square footage. Um, so the renovation option is coming in around 18,000 square feet, whereas all new construction is, is coming in at 16,000 square feet. So there's a little spatial difference due to the nature of construction. And you'll see that more when we look at the plans. Um, then I um, just wanted to briefly talk about the site. Uh, a site is basically the same. I actually have them both up. You'll see the site amenities are the same for, for both options, just a little different as relates to the buildings themselves. Both of the buildings are on the north part of the site, uh, aligning with Springdale, kind of representing town center. Um, but they have the same amount of parking. There's 63 spaces here. There's another 22, net 22, um, potential overflow spaces on this field. And then another five spaces there. So we, when you include those and then the 20 or so spaces on Springdale, there's a total of uh, 105 spaces on site or next to the site. Um, we're trying to preserve as much natural space as, as possible. That's really our inspiration is this sort of view. So looking at a naturalized landscape to the south of the building and, and preserving the play field um, as is, as big open green spaces, as well as on the front of the building. And then as you get closer, here's the drop-off zone with accessible parking nearby and um, a little forecourt. You can see the kind of experience that will be where you can meet people and gather before entering or after exiting the building. So it's kind of the mediating outdoor space between the building itself and the larger site. 
Um, we are uh, reviewing the designs with the building committee of both a small uh, court space in the, in, the, in the location of the existing court and then a small play area mainly for young youngest the youngest children not really a playground certainly have other playgrounds on in town but it's just a small play area um, part of that especially the court is to support parks and recs uh, after school activities um, you can see this is the the new construction option it's basically the same um, the details of the courts are a little different uh, the patio is just on the south in the in the new construction because the, co the common room is, community room is just on the south. But it has all the same features, same amount of parking. And here's just some imagery of what that landscaping might look like, kind of what some of these low seat walls near the building would look like, and as well as the kind of naturalistic play structure that we might have in the play area. Um, one of the big features we've talked about throughout is a walking path that goes around the building, and uh, that would have some seating along it but that was, that was an amenity to provide on-site exercise, especially for Council on Aging. So, uh, you know, in a nutshell, that's, that's the site. It's similar, as I said, for both options. Um, and uh, and uh, so we'll, we'll now talk about the buildings. Um, this is a brief overview and then we'll go into details, but, you know, we feel we've worked hard with the committee and, and the OPM and, 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 and our team, and we've developed two excellent choices. They have the same program, as we've said, um, in terms of activities. There's a slight difference in, in the size of the buildings, um, but the cost is the same. And, and so some of the differences are that the new construction, I mean, the renovation is saving the original 1910 uh, elementary school portion of the Carroll Elementary School, and then adding what we call a pavilion, uh, which houses the community room, the kitchen, and the cafe. So it's it's a kind of smaller sibling to the existing building. Uh, this option is has more traditional forms, but the new construction might be a little more contemporary with materials, but still very compatible with the brick, which would be the main theme uh, for both these options. The new construction uh, being new. Uh, you know, really for efficiency needs a, a flat roof, which would also support future uh, solar panel installations. Um, but that gives it a more contemporary look automatically to have a flat roof. And so we've worked hard. The, in this case, the materials would be how we would relate to town center. So we would use a very traditional flashed brick, very similar to what's on the townhouse or the um, town library. And, and that brick facade uh, along the whole Springdale Street would, would be the primary mechanism by which we relate to the central area, I mean, to the center of town. There would be a little bit of accent material um, on, on the side and on the community room, we'll see that in a minute, but the primary material front and back is brick. Uh, one other difference on a big level is that the uh, central focus of the new construction is, this, is the central lobby and stair, which really ties the floors and the east and west sides together. So that, that central lobby or heart of the community, as we've talked about sometimes in our presentations, is, is the real focus of this. And then, uh, as I was suggesting in the renovation option, the pavilion space itself is more of the focus and it's on display for the whole town as you pass by, either on Center or Springdale. Um, so now I'll We'll take a deeper dive and, and look at uh, the plans as well as uh, interior views and exterior views of both options. So this is the, uh, the, the first floor of the renovation area. This little stippled area is the, represents the footprint of the existing 1910 schoolhouse. It would be uh, completely gut renovated is what we call it. You, we, we would strip it down to structure and to the inside of the exterior walls and then build back all new. So new floors, new ceilings, new walls, new systems. Uh, and we'll show this better on the elevations, but there's also new windows, enlarged windows. Um, this is currently the blue room. Enlarged windows in what's the COA suite and two new windows uh, for the personal care and COA director. Um, so we have a sort of COA suite here uh, next to the gathering room. Um, readily ready access on the first floor 
And then the primary spaces, uh, primary assembly spaces are the community room, as I've mentioned with cafe, and then the recreational court, which is a multifunctional space. It will be set up certainly to play ball games and be used by parks and rec, but it could be used for large assemblies or events, dances, meals, et cetera. So it's a multifunctional space as well. And then in back in what's the existing elementary uh, cafeteria, those we're using those as storage spaces um, because they don't have the best light and the, they're, little, they're even more below grade. The grade will be all regraded around this uh, just in, in terms of installing drainage and, and maintenance. Um, and that, so there won't be any issues with lowering the window sills in the COA suite. We propose to bring them down to three feet above floor height, which is typical for an office building. You don't want to go much lower because that's below a desk and, and not very useful. Um, so upstairs uh, are some of the other activity spaces really taking advantage of the, the upper floor of the 1910 building, which has a tremendous high ceiling. It's 12 foot high ceiling with 11 foot high windows. Yeah, that's one of the great things about older construction like that is they really built, built right in terms of uh, the spatial qualities. So we'd have the uh, flex spaces, which this is a divisible pair of spaces that can be joined or, or, or run separately for, for activities. And then the movement studio, which could be anything from yoga to uh, dance classes for the kids or adults. Um, and then the conference room up there. So, uh, you know, smaller up a uh, second floor in this option than say the two-story option. Um, and you saw, saw pictures on the right of kind of the kind of activities we're, we're tr trying to support. Here's a, what we call a building section, kind of sliced through the building to give you a sense of how these different spaces relate. So you see the, the community room with this large ceiling, taking advantage of being a single story structure to have a tall ceiling and an exposed roof structure. Uh, the cafe sits right outside that, becomes a little forecourt uh, preparation or ticket taking area, depending on what sort of event is happening inside. Um, this is actually a view of the south vestibule, which will be the main entrance. And then you can see Parks and Rec is just to the side of that. So Parks and Rec is located in both plans with good visual control and access, a good place for a welcome desk, whether that's outside as shown or, or inside as a transaction window. So Parks and Rec is kind of in a prime spot to really monitor the building and support the building. Um, and then uh, here are some interior views of what those spaces look like. We put a little watercolor filter on because uh, you know some of the details are obviously yet to be worked out. This is just schematic design, but volumetrically, this is definitely what we're talking about. Um, a, you know, a roof, what we call a roof monitor, a skylight up ahead, above, the exposed wood decking, really dramatic ceiling, really lovely light. Um, the the community room and the renovation option is, a, has, is open to the south, as you can see here. And there's a similar set of windows um, behind this view to the north. So it really has connections going both ways. Um, and uh, it's shown here with tables, but they'll be able to be cleared out and be stored uh, in this little pocketed area here for other events. And then the, here's a view of the cafe and kind of how that sits outside, how you can see outside from the cafe or and into the community room. And, uh, you know, so in both of these um, options, you know, we're supporting the same activities, whether it's congregate dining, we've sized the community room to support the um, theater rehearsals that the Dover Foundations and others have been doing. Um, and a uh, big concern was a connection to, from the inside to the outside through patios, through glass, through doors, kind of a nice even flow in and out to really take advantage of a wonderful site. Um, and, and here is the site. Uh, this is the view from Springdale, the, you know, the public view, the view you'll see if you drive by, uh, probably not the view if you visit the building, most likely people will park in the back and come in from the south side. Um, but again, this, uh, this is a good sense of, of what you'll see and how it relates to, I mean, you know townhouse, you know the center of town. So, so this will give you a sense of how it relates using a massing, having a sloped roof, really accenting and setting off, deferring to the existing building, which is larger and um, of course, historic and more meaningful to Dover. 
Um, and these are some of the materials we're considering. Um, when we say terracotta, this is an example of terracotta. It's actually the same sort of clay that brick is made of. It's just done in a more contemporary manner. And you can see in this example of another building how uh, a terracotta addition was done next to an existing historic brick building. So very similar to what we're looking at. Um, and then here uh, is the view from the south. So again, another set of windows, the community room opens up. There's a little patio, a low seating wall. Um, we'll have flowering trees closer to the building to really give some life uh, as well as a little bit of shade um, to the building. We are trying to preserve some of the uh, older trees and there'll be some underplanting, but largely, you know, really trying to keep a natural open space feel. Uh, because of this view angle, you can't really see the, the paving there of the forecourt, but this is over where the drop off is. The site kind of slopes down uh, to get to the entrance so that we have an accessible entrance uh, since this will be the primary path that most people use. So that is the renovation addition option in a nutshell. Um, now I will go through the uh, new construction, which will be a little bit uh, repetitious, but uh, um, I'll try to focus on the differences since they do have the same program. So again, similarly, the community room and kitchen are here on the first floor. And this one, the community room faces south and, and to the east, but doesn't go through the whole building. And then the recreation court is in a similar location. Um, tucked over here and you can see Parks and Rec is in a similar location. So when you come right into the, from the south, it, it's right there. There's a spot for a welcome desk outside as well as one inside, um, depending on how the town decides to operate the building. There's a play area. The cafe is in that center space, the heart of the community or welcome area. We'll show that from the inside in a minute. And then over on the west side are, are the mechanical and storage spaces needed to support the building. Now, in order to balance the building, um, we needed to find some program that wanted to be upstairs. And what we did is we really thought hard about that. And we tried to find um, spaces that really could take advantage of the wonderful um, views and, and taller ceilings. Um, the ceiling heights in the new construction are a little higher because it is new construction. We're not constrained the way we are in the, in the renovation option. So, you know, we have the COA suite up here, kind of in the penthouse corner. Uh, with the gathering room next to it and then the flexible activity spaces right next door. So this is almost a, a mini senior center um, with doors here out to the to would be a small deck. And as you'll see in the renderings, really, you know, wonderful daylighting, natural daylighting, controlled through overhangs. So it's not, there's no glare and a great view of the, of the site. Um, so that, that's in one corner is this kind of COA senior center suite. And then the other corner is the movement studio kept away to avoid any acoustic issues and a little bit of storage and some supplementary bathrooms to, comp to complete the floor, the second floor. Um, and uh, here's a section through that so you can kind of get a sense of that. So um, the community room itself is not as tall as in the other option, but the overall um, second floor height is taller than the renovation option. So certainly the lobby is taller. Um, and then the meeting room um, and the COA suite behind that has a nice tall ceiling. Here you can see the overhang. So the sun comes in, the sun is higher in the summer. So this will provide nice shade in the summer. And then in the winter, it's a lower angle. So, so you'll, it'll come in and provide nice lighting. Really, you know, wonderful space, wonderful view from that deck. Um, and then we've, we've put a skylight above the stair. You, this really shows how the stair is, is a vertical connector. And you'll see that in a second with the interior views, but uh, really not only brings light down, but kind of lets the space flow up and really connects the two floors so that they don't feel separate. Um, and uh, here, are, here are two views of that space. So you can see how light filled it is uh, with the taller ceilings and the large areas of glass. This is the view out to Springdale. You can just sort of see the trees. Um, of townhouse beyond. And then on, on this view, we're kind of looking backwards to the south and you can look diagonally through the community room and then out into the, uh, the southern part of the site, that naturalized landscape. So you're, 
when you're in the center, the heart of the community in this option, you're really connected to all the spaces and to the outdoors, both north and south. Um, and then you can see the light coming down from the stairs. So that, that you know, that open stair, which we're allowed to do in a two-story sprinkler construction, really, you know, taking advantage of that, making it feel like one, one building. Uh, and then, uh, you know, here is what it looks from the outside. Like I mentioned with the small rendering, uh, we're using materials and color in particular. Well, this is what we call the flashed brick. It's a traditional brick forming. It has that nice gradation. And that's what you see on the existing 1910 school building. And that's what you see on the townhouse. And so we would use a very similar brick, but it may be in a more contemporary manner. So we, we might do um, some some more contemporary brick textures. That's sort of what the lines represent here and here, as well as areas of flat, regular brick. But an all brick facade with large areas of glass, you know, this is a contemporary take with traditional materials, um, but all brick on the front. And then a little bit of a secondary material as you turn the corner. Uh, you can see the movement studio up here with its big area of glass. So that's kind of one anchor. And then the COA suite is the, is the top corner here, really visible from all three sides. Kind of, this is the beacon that you would see, certainly in the e winter evenings with light, uh, in, in night, night light condition. Um, and then the central glass area, um, connecting it all together. Uh, and this is the view from the, from the south side. So you can see those overhangs providing nice shade so you don't get glare. Um, but you have a wonderful view out onto the landscape. Um, smaller shades on the, on the gym, also a uh, recreation room to avoid uh, glare on that. And the entrance is in the middle, can't quite make it out, but there's a canopy that, that comes out to kind of announce the entrance. And as with uh, the renovation option, the site is graded uh, at an accessible grade. So you can come from drop off right down into the entry and really have this flow in both options, uh, 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 in, indoor, outdoor flow from the major spaces. So um, those are the, that's a quick overview of the two options. Um, we thought maybe at this point we should um, open it up for questions to see what people, um, you know, or what people want to ask about. And then, and then we'll, um, and then we'd like to uh, poll everyone informally just to see, uh, take everyone's temperature and see what, um, whether there's a preference or not at this point. That'd just be interesting to know. Ultimately, this will be decided at town meeting. Um, and we are as a team and a committee presenting both options, I think fairly neutrally. Um, and it's for the town to decide which option they want to pursue. pursue. Thank you, John. Uh, this is Ford Spalding again. Um, we're going to take you off a of mute, but before uh, we entertain the questions, let me sort of run through the town meeting um, and how the votes are going to go, which could be very helpful. There are going to be town, five town meeting uh, ward articles. Uh, article one is a renovation uh, option, um, and article two is the new construction option. These are really where you're going to show your preference as to which one you would like to move forward uh, for funding. If the for Article 1, the renovation, receives 51% or more of the vote at the town meeting, we then would not take up Article, article 2, new construction. Um, that would be uh, just not, won't happen, and we move right to Article 3. If Article one, the renovation option did not uh, receive 51%. We then would move to the new construction and hopefully that would receive 51% so we could, uh, or over, so we could move to article three. If neither one does, really the town then will have decided that they don't want to proceed further with this project. So let's assume that renovation or new construction uh, gets over 51%. We'll then go to Article 3, and that's the funding article. That requires a two-thirds vote to move forward. Um, and we're going to need two-thirds of the people that attend to approve funding. 
you will be receiving, not this evening, uh, because we don't have the information, but uh, the selectmen are going to deal with it, I believe, uh, a week from tomorrow, a week from Thursday, uh, the financing options, which uh, the little I know, or as much as I know, is really extremely favorable. But um, then uh, if we receive two thirds vote for Article 3, then it will go to a town meeting election, special election, which will be held on June 21. So June 12 is a special town meeting and June 21 is the uh, special election. And that needs a 51% vote to finalize the uh, financing and allow us to go out for bid. Article four is the park and recreation is requesting an additional thousand square feet to be put in the recreational space, taking it from 2,500 square feet to 3,500 square feet. Uh, that is a funding article that needs two thirds vote to move forward. If that moves forward, it will then be combined in the town meeting, excuse me, the town election on the 21st for final funding. If that all happens, that article becomes part of the building project. Article five is a citizen's article is for preschool to add additional scope and cost to the project. The same thing is true of article four, if it uh, receives a two thirds vote and if it receives a 51% uh, vote at the town election, that becomes part of our project. So that's how the town meeting is gonna work. You're gonna hear that over and over again and Jim Rapetti will probably recite it to you on, on the 12th, but uh, that's the way it works. So let's uh, open this up, Ruth, uh, for questions. Um, I, Ruth, cannot see anyone, so I don't know who's asking a question. So, so the, the best thing I think that we can do is if John could stop sharing his screen oh, and yeah, we can sorry. see everybody at gallery. Um, and then if you would like to ask a question, um, if you use the raise hand reaction, which is at the bottom of the screen under reactions, you can raise your hand and this will bring you to the front of our screens. Um, and then you can unmute yourself. So we've got a question already from David. Oh, thanks. Thanks for that uh, overview. That was terrific. Now, please um, identify yourself and your uh, home address, please. Yeah, David Green, 119 Farm Street. Um, earlier on in the earlier presentations, an energy use intensity goal was established for the project at 30,000 BTUs per square foot per year. Mm -hmm. And I want to know where we are with regard to that energy use intensity target, because that drives the overall carbon footprint, pollution emissions, and ultimately the bills as well, the, the heating bill and the electricity bill for the building. Could you comment on that, please? John, Absolutely. Could you, uh, do that? Uh, yep, and well, David, I know you're all up, up on the lingo, so you're absolutely right. I was gonna call it KBTU, but 1000 BTU, KBTU, uh, it's the same. Uh, that still is our target. Uh, uh, that presentation, I think that you may be recalling, we were evaluating three different systems or ground source, heat pump, air sourced heat pump with VRF, and, uh, and then a more uh, standard package rooftop unit. We are still, because of that, we're pursuing the VRF option, so air sourced heat pump. Um, and our, our modeling was actually showing it slightly below 30 kBTU, but it, this is a conceptual model, so we don't wanna overpromise. So our target is still 30 kBTU. And um, we also had received uh, oil and electricity uh, bills from Carl Warnick for the last two years. So we've been able to calculate that the existing building, not surprisingly, is much worse. The existing building was 80 KB, KBTU. And for everyone else's um, edification, this is a measurement, uh, as the name is energy use intensity of the amount of energy a building uses per square foot. So it's a way to compare buildings of different sizes to each other because it's the intensity of use, not the total amount of use. Uh, it's also important to, as a goal for carbon uh, neutrality or, or net zero energy as goals. Um, previous green building systems had measured buildings against theoretical or code compliant buildings. And they ended up actually, they used less than the code required, but um, 
they still used more energy than the building they were replacing. So by looking at energy use intensity and looking at the existing buildings use of 80 kBTU, you can see that we're well on the path of reducing the energy use of this building by more than 50%. Um, John, why don't you, uh, because it may come up as a question from David, so let's see if we can anticipate. Um, solar panels, uh, could you entertain that discussion and perhaps our a meeting with Beacon Integrated Solutions, Beth Greenblatt, and yeah, uh, we had a be coordinated with the town. We had a great meeting with Beth Greenblatt as a coordinator who's helping the town, and the town, as you may know, is pursuing an in actual con final contract negotiations for for a, a PV and roof replacement combined PV roof, roof replacement project on the town uh, highway department garage. Uh, we've started. Uh, through the town um, asking as to whether we could modify that contract before it's fully executed uh, to add the, um, the, this, this project's roof to it. There's a different, we went over this before, there's a, depending on the option, uh, there's a differing amount of roof that's readily available for uh, PV, the new construction, obviously the whole roof, it's flat, it's designed for that. Um, so that was, I believe around 6,000 square feet. Uh, the way the renovation option has turned out, it's largely the area of the recreation court itself, which right now is 2,500 square feet. If Article 4 passed, it would be 3,500 square feet. Um, in either case, even with 6,000 square feet, uh, it, it's not going to be enough to fully balance the building and, and make it net zero. Um, but it, 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 you know, it certainly could help. Um, we've had discussions about whether it makes more sense to just, as it, for the town, to um, develop off-site uh, PV, which would be more cost-effective, and would, you know, essentially balance out the usage of the of this building. Um, part of our strategy also is just that it's an all-electric building. That's a bit by necessity since there's no gas on site but we're making sure that the mechanical systems, even the water heaters are electric and not say propane uh, as a way that uh, it, whether Dover itself offsets the electrical use or, or the Massachusetts grid has a goal of, of eventually becoming fully renewable and net zero. So this kind of will set the building up to piggyback on those state efforts. And in other words, as the state grid becomes more green and more renewable, then this building will become more green and more renewable. John, could you go one more step, everybody? <laughs> um, we're looking at a, a, when people hear electrical uh, and power, we're still looking at a generator. Yes, yes. Um, and resiliency, I, meant, I briefly touched on that. That was one of our criteria for success. So uh, we have a fairly large generator, a 200 kilowatt hour, a kilowatt generator. Um, we haven't done precise calculations to, to size it, but the, the generators come in, in in various increments. And at 200 kilowatt, hour, um, kilowatt capacity, that'll be enough for startup usage for the mechanical system or the elevator. And it, basically, it'll be sufficient to run the entire building. Um, you have to have these peak loads for things like the, the, the motors for the elevator, which drives a part of the size of the generator, but then that leaves us a generator with a capacity that could basically run the whole building. Uh, so we're buying a little bit more generator right now is the plan, but that will actually save us in wiring. We won't have to have a separate emergency electrical uh, feed system going out to all the different light fixtures and, and other electrical implements, because basically we'll be able to run the whole building uh, off the generator. And it's sized, uh, I believe, to have, uh, I can't remember the gallons, but it basically have two days of capacity of diesel. Um, you know, that's open to more investigation and design development. But right now, the thought is, although diesel is less, high, you know, less than preferable, um, it, it, is, it is the easiest available. And the, and the criteria for the generator really is to support the functioning of the building as a cooling or warming center. So we wanted to have readily available supplemental fuel in the case, especially say there's a winter uh, ice storm and uh, you know power goes out and so you need a warming center. We wanna ha have the generator be able to um, be refueled readily. And so diesel for that reason seems the most um, 
the, the most optimal source John, from a resiliency you. point of view. John, thank you. Linda Pettit, I think I saw your hand up. Thank you. Uh, a point of clarification, especially uh, for many of our residents who are fairly new or newer to town than some of us, um, in terms of the hybrid version or uh, plan, um, there are three sections to Carroll School. And the, I, I think a lot of people don't realize what those three sections are. You have the 1910, then you have the back part, and then you have the newer part where the child care center is at present. Mm -hmm. And I think that could just be clarified for a lot of people so they understand what we're taking down, what we're keeping, uh, because I think that is a matter that many people don't completely understand. Yeah, that's a good point. I'll, um, I'll just quickly share my screen again. I don't have our demolition. Actually, I, I can share one of our building drawings. Uh, let's see. While, um, John's, while John's looking for that, I just wanted to say that um, if you did want to ask a question, but you don't want to ask it live and you just want to put it in the chat, then please do. And also, if you wanted to add any comments in the chat, then we'll make sure that all the building committee get to see those as well. So thank you. My little control bar is buried, Ruth. Oh, here we go. Uh, share the screen and then... Well, John is looking also, um, being an outdoor town meeting, we are not gonna be able to show on a screen all that you're seeing. Um, we will have a document file of, which we will be able to hand out to you, a paper. Um, and when we go through the presentation, we'll tell you exactly what page we're on so you can follow along. We've also are developing, which I hope will be done the end of next week or the first part of the next following week, a very a fairly comprehensive uh, FAQ or questions that have been asked and information that we think is per pertinent uh, in there. So that will be disseminated both uh, electronically um, on the town website and in any other way that we can think to do it. And we'll have copies for the town meeting. It'll probably go into more depth than we can go into at the town meeting also. So any of these documents that you can get ahead of time would be probably helpful to you. But as mm -hmm. I said, on June 2nd, uh, we're gonna have a pre-town meeting presentation. So uh, that way you're gonna hear it twice if you come to both, uh, both of them. Please come to the second one on the 12th because that's when you vote. Go ahead, John. All right, so this is a demolition plan. This is from our a schematic design set. And this illustrates exactly what uh, the question was about uh, for, for newer residents here is the 1910 footprint, the original building. I'll do 1910. Uh, also originally there were stairs out the front. Uh, that's why there's no windows in the middle. Um, at some point those stairs were taken away and the 1931 uh, addition was added. That's the way most people enter the building is, is from the south entrance. It's a split level design. So you kind of enter in the middle and then you either have to go immediately up or down uh, to the upper level or the lower level, which is at 159. Uh, this, our, our, our renovation addition option takes that 159 datum of, of this level and then extends it out. But we're replacing, this is the 1971 edition as well as the piece in between also dates to 1971. That's that kind of tower with the glue lamp buildings, kind of looks like a ski lodge from the inside. Um, haven't ha heard a lot of public comments about saving this portion, but, <laughs> um, but generally what we found is that because of the different floor levels and uh, mm -hmm. it's actually some minor structural issues in the 1971 issue, the terms of renovation, we looked at different alternatives, but really the best thing was to save the, the core original building. Like I mentioned earlier, that has the highest ceilings. It has a solid masonry uh, exterior wall, but has wonderful tall windows on the upper floor. And I looked at that with my structural engineer. We went up into the attic. It's a very simple wood frame construction inside with some steel beams running across. Uh, so it's basically um, 
we need to sister some extra um, joists in for the for the second floor, but otherwise structurally it's good to go. Thank you, John. Um, I saw one question on the chat uh, related to the CDC. Um, will the lease be extended to them or not extended to them? We are not planning uh, on the CDC um, or any preschool in this design. Article five is going to be asking that it be included. But uh, as you know, we didn't uh, uh, plan on doing it uh, on this one. Um, so uh, there'll be no lease for any activity in the building uh, at all. We're not, you know, in the way the room, the building is run today, the town is uh, basically leasing space to, let's say, Aaron's Dance, and she's the only one that occupies that. That's not going to be the case uh, going forward. Um, I don't see, do I see any other hands up? Oh, Sierra Bright, I see you. You know, we Sarah Sierra doesn't know this, but we talked about her before you were in, and, and uh, you know, we're letting the team come in, and and I got the note. We should probably let Sierra in early because she's really been at every. I think every single meeting. So we're gonna probably, if she makes it to town meeting, we'll probably give her an award. <laughs> Go ahead, Sierra. I hope not. I do not have a hand raising on my reactions, which is why I had to raise my actual hand. Um, just a few questions. Um, will the building reach any LEEDS designations? John? Um, currently, we are not pursuing LEED as, as a certification. That's up for the building committee. We're certainly, um, as designers, more than capable. Um, I've done uh, at least a half dozen LEED buildings, including three gold buildings. Um, so, you know, we have the skills to do lead, but generally uh, when we had sustainability discussions with the committee, the, as you saw in the criteria for success, the issues of energy efficiency and resiliency were the dominant issues. And we're going to do best practices for interior health and materials, air quality, et cetera. But it was at, at this point, I think the consensus of the committee was that the, the extra paperwork and, um, bit of financial fees for lead wasn't really adding that much more uh, to the project, but um, we certainly could pursue that. It, uh, typically that's decided in design development, which is the next phase but of how construction. Close, how close to achieving um, that status would we be? You're breaking up, Sierra. Are we anywhere near any kind of Oh, I mean, I'm sure we could. I'm sure we could get silver. I haven't done it. I haven't done a, a rough scorecard. I'm sure we could get silver. Um, okay. But the challenge with lead is 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 expensive to do better than silver. Um, mm. You know, sort of things we're talking about the energy savings. Um, you know, if we could get PV uh, on the building, that would help for lead. Um, but it has a it has a significant first cost, although it's operationally makes a lot of sense. Um, as, you, as you heard at the beginning, we're dealing with first a large first cost as it is. What is PV? And your second a photovoltaics. Question. Oh, okay. Um, my second question is: um, Is it possible to get more um, windows on the east and west sides of the 1910 building? Uh, there are none on the movement in the movement room facing west and the play area facing east has only one window and i feel like if that's a place you go to voluntarily that window tucked in the corner of north and east is not going to make it feel very inviting in there yeah so so we looked at that um, one of the challenges is uh while i it is a structurally sound building and i talked about the the lovely qualities of it it's unreinforced masonry so it is a by no means compatible with the modern structural code. So opening uh, window openings in, in an unreinforced masonry building can be done, but we're trying to strike a balance uh, so we don't have to build a whole new steel structure to frame the brick building. So we are adding two windows. Uh, if you saw in the renderings, there's two large windows on the upper floor um, that we are adding. Uh, and then on the west side, because it's a dance studio and you actually need wall space, we're looking at an overhead um, 
you don't want direct light anyways into a dance studio. So uh, right now we have a shed dormer to the west that would let light in, it would bounce off the ceiling and then come down. And then you would have that uh, either in the renovation option, the tall windows, the two tall windows, or in the, in the new option, you would have that large window um, to provide north light. Because you want to have wall space for ballet bars, for mirrors. Um, you don't really want too many windows in the dance space okay, at Sarah, eye level. Sierra, you have one more question, then you're done. Okay, I, I have no more questions. Just oh. a couple of very quick comments. And one is, um, it seems to me pretty important that the walking path should be a loop somehow going around the property. In the um, design that was shown today, it's a, sort of a road to nowhere that ends at somebody's fence. And the I think other I could thing, just quickly answer that is, is, yeah. is it really goes to the road. So it depends on exactly what we're gonna do with the uh, uh, egress and the access to the road, whether we use that. But the walking path would, could go very easily go all the way around the building. But you're gonna be- the yeah. internal the, road. Uh, the road area. The service drive uh -huh. for it, yes. Yep. Right, not the street. Yeah. And the second um, question, statement, not question, is um, I hope that you're going to use as many native plants and um, low maintenance uh, sustainable landscaping right. as possible. Thank you. That's all. Okay, thanks, Sierra. Um, I'm looking for hands. Um, we, we, do, we do have, sorry, before we go to Sue, um, we do have two more questions in the chat. Um, so one of these was um, from Laurie. There are only 56 participants on this Zoom. Seems like the information on this project has not been widely shared. Uh, do you think the majority of residents are fully informed on the project options and cost? We met with a number of the groups, local groups today, and we do have a really kind of full plan of the communication that we do want to get out. Um, just by chatting to some people, the, some of the feedback I'm getting is that people aren't attending these meetings because they already know that they've, they've followed some of the websites, they've followed some of my emails, but I'm not going to rest at that. I do want to make sure that everybody does have it. So apologies if you get so much from me. If you feel like that by June meetings, I'll be happy because I want to make sure you're all informed. Um, we, the next question is talking about mailings. Um, so it does talk about the the next question from Sue is talking about that too. So what I will be what we will be doing is we will be getting a flyer together, which will be a one page summary of everything you need to know to be able to vote on this, including the design images. Those will be on paper. We're going to give them to the COA to give out. We're going to see if the library will give them out. We're going to put them in any of the places in town where people are going. Um, we're going to give them out at the dump at the transfer station. So we will get those out as much as possible. I will also make those available electronically and they will be easy to print out. So you can have those for yourself to see at home. We are aiming to do a large board, which will go up at the Carroll Community Center, which will give you the designs on that board too. Um, we're gonna do a weekly email with updates. And if anybody would like to be added to my email list to make sure that you get those, then please add your email address into the chat or personal message me on the chat um, and I will email you that. Um, I'm trying to think if I've forgotten anything else. Um, we, yeah, basically we're just gonna, we're gonna try and do as much as we can. If people do have ideas or specific needs, then please um, reach out to me. Um, there is the Carol feedback at doverma.gov email address, which I will put in the chat as well. And you can contact me there. Um, so I think I've covered both of those questions, but Sue, you've got your hand raised. So is there something else that you wanted to ask? Let me just, Sue, there's one other thing is this is our fourth uh, citizen forum, which I think exceeds anything else that's ever been done in town. And we're gonna have a fifth one uh, on June 2nd. We've had in some of them, uh, one in particular, well over a hundred people uh, have attended. So, uh, and I think our last one, we had 65 people at, that was a couple of weeks ago. So. I think we've done pretty well with attendance. Is it perfect? But uh, no, but um, I find the words out. I was at an event earlier this evening and, and people sure knew about it and I haven't seen them at any chat. So uh, I think the word's getting out. Ruth, do you have another question? Um, there's another question on chat, but again, it's very much about the percentage of town that's informed. And please believe me that I'm gonna be doing everything I can between now and the 12th and the 21st to make sure the word is out. 
And as I said, I do welcome any help and I welcome any ideas um, to get those out. Um, so we'll go to Sue, who was first with a question. Um, Sue, if you want to unmute yourself and ask the question, and then we'll come to Jean. And then just please identify yourself and your address. Yes, hi, Sue Sheridan, 100 Claybrook Road. Um, actually, you answered my question. I couldn't find my hand on the uh, <laughs> Zoom and somebody said to do alt, whatever, and I did it and my hand went up. So right. I think you, you answered the question. Um, you know, I, I think we're just concerned that, that some people, you know, don't know. I just thought maybe a mass mailing to, you know, households, um, at least they will have gotten it. They can't say they haven't. Um, I don't, you know, I, <clears throat> I, I'd like to see this really, you know, um, the town meeting held in the fall where maybe more people can attend if COVID tends to die down. But I know that's probably an impossibility. So that's all I have. Um, thank, thank you. Thank you, Sue. Yeah. And one, yeah. well, actually, one thing that I can say is that if you are all concerned that people, not everybody knows, then you can all help me because you can spread the word. You can talk to your neighbors, your associates, your friends about it, and you can ask them to spread the word. No. Um, sorry, go on. No, I was just gonna say, yes, um, we've been doing that, or at least Thank I you, have. <laughs> okay. Thank you, I really appreciate it. So, okay. so yes, for yes, well, it is so good to hear your voice. Um, the other thing we're going to be doing is, uh, and I ordered them today, you know, all these signs you're seeing for the regional school committee and all that, I assume they're going to come down after the election. And then you're going to see the blue and white vote signs. And they're, they're from us. So um, they're okay. going to be going out. Uh, and they don't say anything more than community center vote. And it'll have special town meeting June 12 and special election June 21. So we're if, not advocating, if, we're just saying these are events that you really need to attend. And if anybody is out walking and see the lawn signs, then there is a QR code on them, um, which if you take a photograph with your phone, it will bring up the website address and direct links to the information. Um, hmm. Please don't do it when you're driving, but <laughs> give it a try when you're walking. Okay, thank you. Other, other thank questions? you. Oh, Jean McDonald, I think you said it has a question. Yeah. Hi, Jean. You're on mute. There That's you go. I, I unmuted. Um, I think in terms of square footage or knowing what the dimensions of a room are, and I see that uh, the COA, there's a meeting room nearby. Um, mm -hmm. Could you say what the dimensions of it are? Is it like 10 feet so by 20 <laughs> feet? What is it? What's the well, dimension? It's, four, it's programmed at 400 square feet. It's a, it, it's the, it's a little different sized in, in the two options. I think it's 398 and 420 in the two options, but it's basically about 15 feet wide and then uh, 400 divided by 15. I can't do that in my head. Okay. I, I'm just concerned that the amount of square footage given to the Council on Aging is much, much smaller than what they're using now. And what they're using now for services is um, shown in the map as 1,388 square feet. And separate from that, they've been using 1,250 square feet in what we refer to as the blue room. And if they're being cut down to, you know, what I saw before was 600 square feet, I'm afraid they're gonna have to cut services in order to provide they don't have enough space. So, so Jean, I'll, sorry, Go ahead. I'll, I'll try and answer this for you. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Um, one thing that I do want to emphasize is that um, the square footage that you're talking about is the COA services. So that's the COA officer office, the personal right. space, the kind of office suite. Right. But in terms of the blue room, that is kind of like your flexible room now. So what the COA will have access to is the whole center they will have access to booking whatever rooms they need or they want that will fit their purpose, whether it's movement, so for the yoga, whether it's flexible space for say crafts, whether it's the community room for a speaker series for the lifelong learning. So 
in a sense, what's happening is the amount of square footage that you're having is increasing because there's going to be so many great rooms that are purpose built for multi-use for everybody to use. And they're going to have some great equipment and easy to use. And it, it's going to be it's going to be a great center that everybody can use. And there's going to be a lot of extra space that you can use there. I'm, I'm looking at, at the, this place, not for program, but for services and the amount of space for services is um, quite reduced. So, so what, we, we what have been of... through this with, with Janet Claypole, the director. Um, we have all the, all the desks and, and, and um, spots that she needs. We have the same amount of storage, uh, dedicated storage that's, that, that she has now. So we've gone through a couple of iterations with her, but I think she's pretty, pretty happy with that. We have enough space for her two um, support staff, as well as a third staff, and as well as a, a volunteer on top of that separate from her office and the, and the personal service, personal exam space, we have that as well. So um, the spaces may be a little bit tighter, but they we've covered all the bases in terms of dedicated office space. And then like um, Ruth was saying, the functionality is improved, right? So now we're gonna have a new kitchen, a functional kitchen. Uh, and we went over that a lot with, our, with Janet and our kitchen designer, uh, right? Currently you can't use the kitchen at all. It's not certified by the Board of Health. So we'll have a certified um, kitchen that'll be able to serve up to 90 meals, um, have preparation and service functions. So, so the overall space building will be much more functional and, and we will really live up to the goal of flexibility, right? And, and maximizing the utilization, um, I think, what Ruth was alluding to is we've done a program analysis and in the morning, it's gonna basically be a senior center. The, the run of the space will be for seniors and COA can book any and or all of the rooms because parks and recs activities don't really start till about 2.30. Um, then you have to share and um, you know, adult activities end up happening in the evening. So uh, the spaces I think shouldn't be judged purely on their square footage, but on their functionality. After all, the existing building is quite large, but it's not terribly functional. Um, any, okay, Jean, you all set? Uh, I, just, I, I just see other towns building senior centers or building large areas for seniors. And even Medfield mm -hmm. has a 13,000 square foot building for seniors. And, and we're dedicating not a lot of space. And with one meeting room that's, um, of a size where one would have a meeting, um, that's that's not very much when we have activities going on every day. And the, the community room and other spaces are huge, but when you want you want a, a meeting space and an activity space, and there's really not much available. So the in terms of the size of the rooms, you've got the flex space, which is is large if you take the whole thing, but you can cut it. There will be a dividing wall to make smaller spaces. There's also a conference room. Um, so there's, there are a large number of different rooms that would that will fit what the COA need, I'm, I'm sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, um, for, there's a couple of comments in the, there's a couple of questions in the chat before we go to, I think it was Sally and then, no, Joanne and then Sally and Bente Sears, did you want to put, were you trying to raise your hand? It, so okay. you're on mute. If, if you are, Bente, then I will come back to you once we've um, spoken to Sally. So first of all, um, Morgan Guthrie in the chat said, um, she thanked us for the information. Um, she lives at 9 Francis Street. She's got three young children and newish to town. She was wondering with the entire space outside why a playground for children can't be included. She understands there's a toddler space, but it seems extremely minimal. And don't we want to utilize this space for kids, families as well, and an attraction for incoming new families with children interested in moving to town? Um, John, do you want to try that? I think I could too, but what? Are... Yeah, um, Go ahead. so from the beginning with programming, um, you know, we met with the Dover's Mothers Group and the PTO, um, and you know, we're trying to balance uh, outside the building, just like inside the building, a wide range of activities to have you know, support for, for all ages. But um, between that and discussions with the building committee, it was decided that a, that a full playground with all sorts of play equipment wasn't really 
something that, that, that was needed at the Carroll Center because there are other playgrounds in town. And the focus of, of this site development re with regards to children should be more to support parks and recreation activities, especially after school, and then to support very young children um, because there's a youth scenario where parents, maybe mothers, maybe fathers, are, are picking up or dropping off an older child at a parks and rec activity and they have a very young child who needs something to do while they wait. So that's kind of where the toddler idea came from is for, for kids who are too young for a parks and rec activity, but maybe waiting for an older sibling uh, either before or after. Uh, and that's open to further development with the building committee, but that's kind of where we are right now. Thank you, Jim. So the next question is from David Green. Um, what will be the increase in taxes for the average home in Dover at the new 18 million budget? David, that's a great question. As I said in the beginning, I don't know if you were here, but um, the selectmen are having a meeting, I believe, a week from tomorrow, Thursday, and uh, they will be um, sharing at that time uh, the financing plan. Um, all I can say is what I do know, it's very attractive. And I mean, when I say attractive, that means I'm not paying a ton of, ton of money. It's, it, it's, it's good. We're losing um, the Chickering School and the, um, and the regional school are going off our, our debt level. So and this would be going on. So uh, that will be coming and it'll be in our FAQ um, as soon as the selectmen release it and we'll be uh, publishing it. So that's coming. Go ahead. Thanks, David. So next is Joanne, then I'll come to Sally and then Bente. So Joanne, if you could unmute yourself. Joanne, if you're there. Yep, I am, I just couldn't, <laughs> wouldn't have you. <laughs> I just wanna clarify um, the space. I was actually the person that was um, redesigning the current space and, and allocating space. And, and just to be clear, the large area that we have in the current um, uh, building is more than half um, a place where you get a cup of coffee or a little snack. And then the other part of that is where you go and sit and, and chat and, or just have some quiet time. Those are not going to, though we you can't confuse that with losing space because that is, is more than going to be doubled um, in the new iteration. So, so I, you know, uh, yes, on record, it looks like maybe we're losing a lot, but we're not really there all the activities and so forth are going to be well taken care of so i you know i uh i just want to make a you know a fact we're not losing space it's just um being allocated in different places and different uses and so thank you Joanne. A, thanks Joanne. that's a great point that the social and that was very intentional the social right aspect of the coa suite right now it has been in both these plans moved out so that the office can do office work and the socialization can be social. So they, those are now separate spaces. Thank you. Um, Sally? Yes, um, Sally Helwig. Uh, I would just like to say that I still have concerns about dedicated gathering space for the COA. I'm, I'm not sold, and my, my computer's about to die. Sorry, I'm losing battery power. Um, I'm not sold on this. Um, the blue room area where, which was dedicated gathering space in the current building um, is important space, uh, as well as there's additional space where the offices are, where people can sit around a table or there's various um, activities. The, my concern is even though I understand that you have other activity rooms that you can book, it's not the same. I think it's important that seniors in particular feel like they can go there and feel comfortable uh, interacting with people in a dedicated gathering space for them. So while I'm hearing Joanne, you say, I would like to know what quantify, how much space is currently in the existing office area, uh, not just offices, but the office area that where, where um, Janice, I guess Janice's office is there and there's a bunch of offices and there's that personal 
meeting room and in the blue room. Um, I just think that kind of space is really important. Well, I think, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Joanne. Well, I was just going to comment, Sally. The thing is that it was really a conflict when more than, say, four or five people came into the office because the noise level was such that, in fact, the workers couldn't get their, their work done. Um, so in many ways, from the uh, COA point of view of being able to do their work, it's going to be much more efficient space. And it wasn't a lot, we really fought with getting enough area and space that, uh, and trying to fit those two other things into that room, it never really worked well. So I'm not advocating for anything, I'm just trying to state facts, that it wasn't as, um, you know, as smooth a transition as one would like to believe. Okay. And it wasn't, the blue room is not COA space. It's just, it's general space that can be used by COA. So we always had to sign in for that space, if I'm not mistaken. You know, we had to say, we would like it at such and such time and park and rec, mm -hmm. you know, and Janet would work it out. So, so I we actually thought it was not the I same. I thought that was the OA space. No. That was the OA space. It is the well, it was primarily used by COA. Well, it, okay. okay. I, all, all I'm going to say is I, I have been to, over the years, quite a few different community centers with senior space. And I think of Weston. And when you went into, and I'm sure a lot of you, I would think, I hope, have seen it. And when you walk into that space, that is dedicated space for seniors. And there's offices and there's areas where you can sit and chat. And it's, but it's, for seniors. And I really think if we're going to spend all this money, I want to make sure that the seniors have space that is theirs, not a room that you have to book to go and meet a few people if, if you want to be there. Um, let me clarify, and then I think we need to move on. This is a community center. And the community center is for ages, I say, three to 93. Uh, we've gone through a, an example of the life, day in the life of a community center where it's used early in the morning by maybe parents uh, who have to school, kids go to school and before they go to work, they'll work out or they'll do their activities. Seniors are in the building from 9.30 or so till two um, where they're gonna really have 90% of the building all to themselves. And then after that, the school uh, children come in and use the building. And then in the evening, uh, the adults do. So that's, um, we looked at 15 community centers around, and that's the way most of them are all run. Uh, this is not a senior center. It's not a youth center. It's not an um, adult center. It's a community center for the town of Dover. And it's a place where the citizens of Dover can come in, meet friends, make new friends, socialize, and do activities. That's the purpose of the building. That's what it was designed for. And that's what we're asking the town to support. The town's going to have an option of whether they want to approve either the new or the renovation or continue on with what they have been. Any other questions? Uh, I see one from Bob Zokoff. And the question I don't know how to answer is that what percentage of town is informed and therefore making the voting decision? You know, I just, you don't know that. We have a presidential election, for example, and what percent of the town is, is informed or not? I don't know, but we have 30 or 40 percent of the town voting. Um, you know, you know, so um, we've done everything we can to reach out to the community using the town a website, using social media, using print media, uh, emails, talking to people. Um, I think my take is there are more people informed about this and are interested in it that are just showing up, for example, to this evening's meeting. Um, so, Ruth, um, do you have any questions? Yeah, there's one in the chat and then we'll go to Linda. So the one in the chat, um, actually, no, there's two in the chat. So I'll do one in the chat, then Linda, and then the other in the chat. Um, so from Lauren Doherty, um, who is one of the abutters, it appears the size of the gym in the renovated building is significantly larger than the gym in the new building. A larger gym would be more beneficial to park and rec and better suited to meet the needs of town residents. Please confirm size differences in the gym in the renovated building versus new building. John? The, uh, the program size should be, I'm sure it's drawn the same as 20, 
500 square feet for both, uh, pending the warrant article related to parks and rec. But that was one of the uh, downsizing moves we made after feasibility uh, is we moved from 3000 down to 2,500 square feet. And it's, it's the same for both is the design. One sticks out a little more in the renderings that may be what you're looking at, but they're, they're the same size. Thank you, John. So Linda. Please remember when you're designing these flex spaces and all that we have a hearing loop in the present blue room and that mm -hmm. has got to be incorporated into whatever and that needs to be specifically a space where the senior programs uh, learn lifetime learning, whatever. Uh, we put in that, that, that um, loop a number of years ago. It's been extremely effective and it's really helped a lot of especially seniors with hearing difficulties. And that cannot be forgotten when you, when you design this new space. John? Janet pointed that out to us several times. And we now have okay. documentation of the system that you have. We'll have to redo the coils, but we can hopefully redo the, reuse the hardware itself. And, right. and it should be a lot easier because we're in most of the rooms, we're gonna be taking it back to the wall. So it's gonna be a lot easier mm -hmm. to put it all in at this point. And, and for those of us that may wear hearing aids and, and need he hearing help, the acoustics in the building are gonna be uh, updated and much better for than we have in the existing building. Um, so we have another question in the chat, Lindsay Pasden. Um, initially, we talked about the fact there was, a, there was no, no option. Can you remind me of the cost to get the current center up to code? So this is, if we don't vote in either the new build or the renovate and people decide they don't want anything like that, then this is, this. Uh, so Ford, if you can speak to it, what would be the cost if we didn't, if we just kept the doors open on this current building? There's a report that the Selectmen commissioned uh, from inside on site, uh, the same group that uh, has worked with the, uh, with the school district in looking at their buildings. We've used it, uh, the towns looked at it for theirs. They looked at the Carroll building. Uh, that report is on the website. It's on our page, as a matter of fact. Um, I don't have the exact number, but it's north of $6 million. Um, and that doesn't improve the building at all. It just uh, does, um, brings it up to, to saves it and keeps it to the new heating, heating system. You know, we don't have air conditioning there, so it doesn't bring in air conditioning, but um, it, it, that's all it is. If I looked at the inflationary costs that have affected our building, and if it's, let's say it's 6 million, I would say that more is probably north of $7 million to uh, do that. And, and if, so if both options are turned down, that's what the town will be uh, faced to do. Okay. Any more questions from anybody? Oh, Bente, I'm so sorry. I didn't come back to you. I'm so sorry. You just need to unmute Bente. It's, it's. <laughs> it's Fred Bente's as well. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank Fred, you. Linda. Fred, you Fred. can do it. You got it. Can go you? Fred. There you go, go, Fred. You're all set. <laughs> this is Ben. This is Bente's spastic husband. No, um, it isn't. You're, okay. it's, it's all right. It's I'm all right, so boy. sorry. <laughs> All right, no, listen, I don't take it personally. I get this all every day. <laughs> trying to ask something that's intelligent and my brain has gone dead at the moment. So here, can you access both buildings from the north side? Yes, absolutely. That was one of our prime criteria. All right. We'll have a appropriately graded uh, sidewalk from Springdale. So we have a very attractive sign to welcome people on that north side? We will. All right. Now, Structurally here for the voting, what is the quorum again, Ford? 175, I believe. 175, and how many did they get for the town meeting? They got 76. Aha. Uh -huh. Oh, you guys are interesting. Hey, Fred, um, Fred, Fred can they, I ask you a question, me. Fred? Fred, let me ask you a question. Which town meeting do you think is gonna be more exciting? Oh, well, it's obvious, Ford, we're, we're winding up here. There you go. But, the, and but the, the town meeting didn't have me nagging everybody. But but we put put this in and on a, on a on a Saturday in June. Yeah. With, with a lot of people. Uh, never mind. It's yeah. a conflict to some people. But if they really want it, they'll show up. Um, I hope so, so. So we got two thirds vote for funding. Um, 
51% to get the articles passed, except for four and five. Four and five are going to have two thirds vote? Correct. They're funding uh, articles. Okay. Very good. And the, but the funding article <laughs> is a 51% on June 21st. Uh, yes, that, 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 that's at the town election, uh, the special town election where you go to the town hall and vote. Right? Okay, so the so the preschool and, and park and rec could get a two thirds to get the article on the ballot for the twenty first. Correct. Okay. All right. So if that's some more money. Someone's got to factor into the tax thing if it goes through. Correct, and those before, numbers uh, uh, before I June are being, before, are, are being addressed before June twenty first. I mean, how well, we will? We, yeah, well, actually. Actually, we're hoping to have those numbers read by a week from Friday. This okay. Friday. And, and I think the question I was going to ask, but I guess it's been answered by a reference to Janet. The, the COA is happy with their space, no matter where it is. I would never, I would never answer for Janet, but <laughs> I will tell you how I think she would. And I think she's on the call, so she can reprimand me. But I think uh, if she was going to answer, she would say, uh, Janet, do you want to answer before I answer for you? Not fair. <laughs> it is not. I can tell you that the, the COA board has talked about that they are in support of the, at this point, they haven't voted on it, but the conversations are, and as many seniors, is their preference is to have the COA on the first floor, which is the renovate, uh, save the 1910 version, versus be on the second floor, which is the new version. Thank you, Janet. That's what I would have said. <laughs> All right, thank you, Janet, and thank you for it. You're very welcome, Fred. Good to see you. Good well, see you. I didn't, <laughs> yes, good to see you as well. <laughs> Any other uh, question? Sarah, um, Sarah's I, Sarah, I think has got one. Do we have to let her talk? Hi. Go ahead, Sarah. <laughs> Okay. Oh, um, this is a different Sarah. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> was it you're talking about Sierra? No, I was talking about Sierra. <laughs> no, I was just gonna say, from what I'm hearing about this meeting, is um, some of the people aren't thrilled with um, what's being offered for the COA. And as a person who hopes to use the COA someday, because I would like to stay in Dover forever, um, right now I'm more focused on the the youth programming. And I think the committee has done an amazing job getting the word out, but I think what's happening to people kind of my age and why you don't see more people going on these meetings right now is because um, we're in the middle of a pandemic and we're talking about a building that people our age haven't been able to use in the last year. And so it's kind of hard for people to um, get engaged with this process right now at the current state. So while I appreciate trying to push this to the June meeting, I wonder if there'd be more community involvement, more participation, more everything, if like there was a pause even, and I know it's hard to say that, but this is just my thought, a pause where people, okay, we've gotten through the school year, we've gotten through like what we didn't know, all the unknowns, and we have been able to, re-enter the building that nobody's been able to really use, at least the, the programs that I've used it for, we haven't used it in over a year. So people aren't really understanding like, oh, this is why we need to actually care about this community center right now. That's my only thought. Like, it's hard to engage right now in a building that we haven't been able to use in over a year. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate the comment. Um, Ruth, if there's anyone, no one else, it, it is 8.30, and uh, we basically said we're going to end the meeting at 8.30, so if somebody has a pressing question, if not, um, thank you all for coming. Um, just a couple of dates to remember. Um, June 2nd is our 7 p.m. is our pre-town meeting presentation. Um, it will be hopefully the town meeting presentation. Um, and you'll be able to see it on your screen. Uh, as I said, we're going to take it to paper when we uh, do the town meeting. Um, so I hope you'll come and we'll be advertising that. 
Saturday, June 12 at 10 uh, a.m. is the magic date. Um, I know it's a difficult Saturday in June. It can be difficult. There are sports events still going on. I know Sherburn is having their town meeting coming up, and, and um, I gather some of the coaches are moving their te yeah, like teams to a later time. Uh, Joanne, um, please mute. If you. Um, to a later time, but that's for coaches to decide. But uh, we're going to do our best. This has been a process that's gone on over 20 years. Um, when we took on this thing, we were hoping to get a decision, and that's what we're working on. If you recall my remarks in the beginning, um, you can only control what you can control. We believe that there are, we can take control of this process and what we're doing uh, by moving forward now uh, and moving the project forward. So thank you all, have a good evening. Uh, we appreciate your attendance and uh, we wish you well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Ruth. Thanks everybody.